the reason for being here is to get people to do something. This is the whole point of talking. We're in dreadful danger, as you know. Nobody's doing, sorry, lots of NGOs are doing something to save the planet, but it's not enough. And without public opinion and without public action, we, we don't even start to fight the battle. We've got a big battle to fight. The matter is extremely urgent. Um, I'm just going to, the, f the most important thing I need to do this afternoon is to explain to you why we're in this mess, how the financial system is run in the world. And the question I uh, pose is, who are our rulers? We know who our rulers are. They are the central banks. They control everything that happens on this planet. And we know more about them recently because of a whistleblower. Um, I heard about her three, four months ago. She's called Karen Hughes. She worked at the World Bank for 20 years and she decided to blow the whistle on what was going on. So we know that there are 147 of these central banks. They are private banks. One of them, for example, is the Federal Bank of America, the Fed, as it's called. You would imagine that it was a bank that represented, represented those federal states, but it's a bank that represents private interest. It's a private bank. The most important of these banks is the Bank for International Settlement, which is based in Basel in Switzerland. Ever, and, it's, and these banks, they, are, uh, not, they don't have to report to anybody. They act completely on their own. They're not responsible to anybody for what they do. And they work in support of the great monopolies, the oil m monopolies and the big agricultural monopolies and so on. And they meet every two months to discuss how to run the world. Their aim is to control all the finance of the world and to own everything. And according to Karen Hughes, they're almost there. They own almost everything. Now then, the way that they do this is they make debt. What they do is they print money, except today they don't need to print it. They just, it's called fiat money. They just say, let there be one trillion dollars. It's always dollars. Let there be one trillion dollars. And they press the buttons and then there are one trillion dollars released into the world. Now then, so this debt is created out of air and it has to be paid back. And it's paid back by real wealth, wealth that is earned by people. And of course, we must realize that uh, even at this stage of what I'm explaining, that this wealth is created from finite resources, particularly from fossil fuels. Um, anyway, it has to be paid back. And it's paid back um, through the taxpayer. The, on the only thing is that governments massively overspend. Uh, I think that the American overspending is 17 trillion at the moment. And obviously they can never pay this money back. It is increasing all the time. Um, but the important thing is, ah, and by the way, this taxpayer who's supposed to pay it back isn't even born. It's to a child, not even born tomorrow, owns thousands of pounds already. Um, and it never does entirely get paid back. What's important is that the interest is paid. They pay interest on all of this. 
The whole of this scheme is run so that the central banks collect the interest on debt. And um, by this means, they have an absolute fortune of money. It, you know, mathematics, how something that starts with one, if it doubles, and it is it's phenomenal, the amount of money they're supposed to have in their books collected by this debt. Anyway, so I think I have to spend time to just explain what government, why, govern, why governments massively overspend. They overspend because they support business and they do it directly through tax breaks and all kinds of things. And they also, as we know, subsidize um, it's subsidy we're talking about. They subsidize the banks. They've just bailed them out recently. And um, so they also subsidize indirectly. Everything that keeps us happy, that we have a free health service, that we pay for people who are, who are out of work. This is very good for us, but it's very good for business. It subsidizes business, you see, and it means that business can run very efficiently, paying extremely low wages, making a lot of profits. Of course, they pay good wages to managers, but they make an extreme amount of profit, paying as little as they can for it. And so the debt increases in order that the central banks can have this interest and control the world and eventually owns everything. One way that's very easy to understand of how they own things, we've, uh, um, I didn't know whether I mentioned that they do control the IMF and the World Bank. And we've all heard of a country in the third world who's been forced to borrow money by the IMF or whichever help uh, think people are working for for this central scheme and um and then they don't th all they do is they have to give up all their precious raw materials in order just to pay the interest that's all that's required of them this is how they come to own everything anyway so um what can we do about it um one thing i mention is that we should try to fight austerity because the squeeze is only to make the debt look not so big because the quicker it increases, the more we panic. And we don't want people panicking. We want the status quo. I'm sorry, the central bank wants the status quo and nothing changing. But you can see that this whole system creates poverty and it creates an incredible and increasing gap between rich and poor, and things can only get worse. So all this talk about growth and jobs, horrible jobs, because every job that's being offered is about destroying the earth anyway, fracking, oh, it's going to make all these jobs in England. Um, it's not, but if it did, it'd be, it's, it's not a job you would want, if somebody said to you, you know, would you like a job in this factory that makes landmines, you know, and we're going to be able to kill so many thousand children with these mines, you wouldn't really want that job. You wouldn't want a job in the fracking industry because it's a, a slower fuse on the bomb, but it's going to go off. Anyway, so the thing is that we need to change the financial system that runs the world. Governments work for business, they do not work for human beings in general, only for a certain few of human beings, not for everyone, not for human values. Um, I just want to say that this new world, you know, if I just say to you, the human race has forgotten more than it knows, we don't know how to build the pyramids, you know, somebody did, um, all kinds of things. My husband's a witch, I bu bumped my head this morning and he cured it. But, um, um, you know, I mean, we, we have the power to change the world, to have a world that's comfortable for everyone to live in, to have a world that's peaceful. The way out of this problem is 
Um, it's a slogan, but remember it. What's good for the planet is good for the economy. What's bad for the planet is bad for the economy. But also, what's good for the planet is good for people. We could have a wonderful world where we helped each other and we were efficient. Uh, I can think of loads of, of things we can do. We only have to have the right aims and we get there. If we've got the wrong aims, which produce perpetual war and destruction, like the one we've got now, well, we're just going down the hole. The planet will ditch us. Temperatures hotter than p uh, human beings have ever, can ever imagine, let alone experience. Anyway, where we are, what can you do? You have to do something. I, in the past, have talked to people about we have to raise awareness, you have to inform yourself, you have to talk to people. This is the way we begin to put pressure on governments to start to do things that are good for us. I mean, the green economy is not just a question of um, saving of green jobs. It's to do with people. Where I live, for example, they're pulling down the social housing in order to, to build luxury flats. The um, green economy would never do that. They would see that that was totally inefficient and only making terrible problems for the future. It wouldn't be saving energy. It wouldn't be saving anything. It's nothing to do with human values. We're doing everything wrong. So even if you want to change things, help somebody, help a poor person or whatever. But listen, the thing you've got to do is action. I, I used to think, I'm just repeating, I used to think that um, it was get yourself informed and this will affect your behaviour and then we can put pressure on governments and we can, we can, public opinion is all we need and we can do this. Right now, I tell you, we have to have governments help us. The question is so urgent. Governments have to change. I mentioned one thing, the Green Party agenda is spot on. I just said that. I don't think I'm allowed to talk about politics regarding parties too much, but, but have a look at that. Now then, what can you do? First, you have to focus on something and don't do it on your own. I'll tell you what I did. When I, when I discovered the urgency of this, this situation. Um, I gave some money to a wonderful charity called Cool Earth. I'll quickly tell you, with just over a hundred million pounds, they can save the three equatorial rainforests. And they do it by working with the indigenous people and they ring fence the forest so it protects the in interior as well. They stop the loggers getting in, which is the first step in protecting the forest. And it's working incredibly well already. It's just an NGO, hands-on, go in there, do it. And I gave some money because I've got some money. I did have, I've got some money, I gave it to them. Um, time is more valuable than money. If you've got time, it's not only money, but do something and do it with somebody else. Get hold of somebody and say, what are we going to do? Maybe you want to go down, organize something at the local school where you talk to the children about one thing that will raise awareness. For example, um, we've, if, we want, if we are against the oil companies and their drilling that's just so dangerous, methane, do you know that's never mentioned? I'll tell you about methane in a minute. But if you go to your school, for example, you might say, well, let's focus on save the Arctic because children would get very interested in this and we can start to do it. Focus. You can't deal with everything. Do one thing, but do something. And you will find that people come to you and things build. If you do one small thing, that's the first step and you will go on. You will discover more it just hap it will happen to you you must do something not think somebody else is going to do it methane you know it's not factored into any of the discussion about what is the most poisonous gas is it worse than coal and all this kind of thing that we need to know methane when it's released it is 20 times more dangerous than co2 it causes more heat and more pollution, trapping us in. And 
this is on a 100-year scale. If you take a 20-year-old scale, because methane, methane dissipates as, it gets, as time goes on, over a 20-year period, it's 100 times more dangerous, more heat-producing than carbon dioxide. It's never even mentioned, because what happens today is that people, they take everything in isolation. This is why the facts are all so misleading. They just tell you something about something, and that's supposed to be it, and they don't factor into it all the other things that are connected. Everything's connected. Anyway, so you have to do something, and I don't hold much hope out for us. Uh, if we go past two degrees, some people say it's too late, we've already gone past two degrees, then you can draw a line parallel with Paris, and below that, everything red is uninhabitable, because it after two degrees, you can't stop it going to five. That is the world at four degrees, five degrees. Um, there you are. Uh, you know, it's less land. War, peace, these are the issues we're, we're facing. Um, I, I think I have finished. I, I, if I've got time, I could tell you one little thing. Have I got time, a tiny bit? I'll tell you one way in which this debt happens. A farmer in America, he's got a contract with the bank. Um, the, he's got this contract because he's got a contract with one of the big agricultural companies. He's producing chickens. Chickens cost about two pounds cooked. When I was little, it used to have it one at Christmas. It was too expensive. Everything is subsidized by this debt that is caused to give the interest to the central banks. Everything's subsidized, it should cost more. Anyway, and so this, this farmer in America, he has to keep borrowing money from the bank to implement better processes, better, quicker ways, more efficient ways of killing the chickens. All kinds, a lake of shit outside, you know, mo uh, terrible pollution, uh, piles of dead chickens, whatever. He has to keep doing this. And what happens is that he or she makes about $20,000 a year, but she or he owes $2 million to the bank, which they can never pay, and they're on this treadmill paying interest to the central bank. This is the world we live in. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>